Uh, welcome everyone to the lecture on uh, catalytic organometallics. This is of course part one. And let's start with uh, a nice reaction from stoichiometric organometallics. As a model compound, research group of uh, Barry Martin Trost at Stanford University, or was in need of uh, this um, <coughs> for synthesis of uh, uh, this compound. Well, this is not a benzene ring, this is a cyclohexane here. So, and uh, the best method for synthesizing such an enone and also a lot of other ketones is, of course, starting with an uh, acid derivative with a leaving group X. Well, and uh, letting that react with an organometallic nucleophile, as we have discussed it uh, in the preceding lecture on stoichiometric organometallics. So, in, in this case, we would like to treat this acid derivative with an alkenyl lithium compound. Well, if we have an ester here, an alkoxy leaving group, then we would have the problem that after the reaction of the first equivalent of alkenyl lithium compound, we will have a ketone, an alpha B also already the alpha beta unsaturated ketone, and this ketone is more reactive, more electrophilic than the ester, and we would uh, uh, get then the double reaction as uh, the competing reaction. Well, you can avoid that a bit by applying the acid chloride, because the acid chloride is more reactive than the ketone. However, the best method seems to be the one having a special amide the methoxy methyl amide, and in this case, we would get as a reactive, as a reactive intermediate, the addition adduct This one with the lithium chelated. This is rather stable at uh, least at uh, lower temperatures and uh, well, will just survive the uh, normal reaction conditions. And after hydrolysis, we will get, of course, an NO hemiacetal which uh, then at room temperature will um, <coughs> just be hydrolyzed. That's it. And the final outcome is then this uh, ketone, which can be isolated in an astonishing 97% yield. This method applying the amides of this methoxy-substituted uh, amine is called the Weinreb Nam Ketone Synthesis. Under this name, you can look that up. So, what was then done with uh, this 
Alkinone in the trust group was treating that with a palladium catalyst, 5% palladium acetate was applied, 35% triphenyl phosphine were present, also possible instead of a triphenyl phosphine are other phosphines, for instance DPPB was tested. So what is DPPB? It's the abbreviation for 1,4-bis diphenyl Phosphino butane. So the B is the abbreviation for the butane. So structure of that should be clear for everyone. It's this one. Another <coughs> phosphine that has been applied was the DPPF. Oh, okay. DPPF, then the F abbreviates ferrocene. And you know this is that iron sandwich. compound, this time as DPPF with two phosphino substituents. So the reaction which was observed works with any phosphine ligand while adding about 50% an acidic co-catalyst, in this case just acidic acid, helps to accelerate the reaction. And while well, you need a solvent, that was toluene at 100 degrees. The product that was obtained was then a diene known, this one, ninety percent, well, based on GC analysis, but between seventy and eighty percent actual yield on a small scale process was obtained. And usually, with uh, enlarging the scale of a reaction, you can isolate a bit more of that, a higher percentage of that. So that means uh, the reaction which uh, the Trost group observed was um, an isomerization. That means, uh, well, a double bond part is migrating to this position and that, and to that. Okay, and of, of course, um, uh, the dienone is uh, thermodynamically preferred compared to the alkynone. So, let's try to explain the mechanism of the reaction. It has a lot, the anticipated mechanism has a lot of uh, um, a typical reaction steps, at least of palladium catalyzed processes. <coughs> All the active 
palladium catalyst, which uh, we need for this reaction, uh, <coughs> seems to be a palladium two complex, but a hydrido palladium acetate. And how should this be formed? So we start with palladium acetate and under the reaction conditions, typically palladium acetate or often palladium acetate is reduced from palladium two to palladium zero. So let's assume two ligands, in this case phosphine ligands, are added. Then we get to palladium zero. We will discuss in detail how this reaction works. And in the equi equilibrium, acetic acid is added to the palladium and we get this hydrido palladium acetate in the oxidation state plus two again which then will react with the substrate. So how does this reduction work? A lot of organic compounds are able to reduce palladium acetate or uh, also palladium chloride and uh, other palladium-2 salts to palladium-0. This is, for instance, possible with some olefins by an uh, addition to the olefinic uh, uh, double bond and then um <coughs> Better hydrogen elimination. We will see uh, examples of that during this uh, lecture course. In this case, it's obvious we have phosphine ligands, and these phosphine ligands are the reducing agents. What will be uh, the product of the oxidation of these phosphines? Well, clearly, phosphine oxides. So how does this reaction proceed? Palladium acetate plus two equivalents, for instance, of triphenyl phosphine gives the corresponding complex. actually a coordinatively unsaturated 16 electron complex. Tomorrow we will discuss that 16 and uh, 18 electron complexes. <coughs> and for instance, in DMF at already room temperature, the reduction occurs, well, and it is initiated that this complex falls apart into this palladate and, on the other hand, this phosphonium compound. Now imagine a hydrolysis and since you have only catalytic amounts of the palladium acetate in there, you only need uh, very small amounts of uh, the water so, water and another equivalent of triphenyl 
phosphine will result in a palladium zero just coordinated with two phosphine ligands. So are uh, coordinatively very unsaturated 14 electron complex, which is very often an active catalyst, for instance, in the Heck reaction, which we also will discuss tomorrow. And, well, what else do we have? Triphenyl phosphine oxide as the stable oxidation product and well, two equivalents of acetic acid. So, <coughs> here we have the, the palladium zero complex corresponding to this, uh, well, L2 palladium zero, adding acetic acid, giving rise to the active catalyst. So, let's have a look at the reaction in focus. Once again, the substrate. Plus the hydrido palladium acetate first step, which was uh, uh, suggested by the trust group, it's a typical step of uh, in a lot of similar reactions. It is on hydropalladation of a triple or a double bond, well, which should uh, remind you of uh, a hydroboration. This is very similar. So a hydrometallation is always uh, proceeding as a ZIN, concerted ZIN addition process. So one could also discuss the reduced selectivity of that uh, addition process. However, for the observed outcome of the reaction, we need, as the next step, a better hydrogen elimination. This is essentially the retro hydropalladation, the retro process compared to the hydrometallation or hydropalladation in this case. It is also uh, a concerted process, and it is a, a ZIN elimination. Well, this is not that important in, in this case, but the ZIN elimination to one of those hydrogens will then lead us to an intermediary aline which has the palladium generally still coordinated. Well, in equilibrium, this could be, the aline could be a 
um, <coughs> set free. However, in this reaction, the allene has not been observed. This seems to be rather highly reactive for a re-addition of the hydro-palladium bond. However, I should mention that indeed, in this case, the beta hydrogen elimination is a bit strange or a bit unusual. If the palladium is located as at an sp3 hybridized carbon with a beta hydrogen, this is usually um, <coughs> a rather fast process if that hydrogen and the palladium can adopt a uh, Zyn conformation. With the palladium sitting at an sp2 hybridized centrum, center, this is an unusual reaction. Well, although there is at least uh, one example known where um, an allenic uh, uh, product was uh, observed, but in this case with uh, uh, cesium carbonate, a uh, special uh, base with special effects in that case. However, here it is claimed that uh, uh, this also works, giving this intermediate and the re-addition reaction should then give this allyl palladium complex and now the beta hydrogen elimination with the palladium sitting at an sp3 hybridized center should be rather fast. Again, setting free the active catalyst and the final product, which indeed has been observed as reported from the tourist group. A few months after these results have been published by Barry Trost from Stanford University. Another group from uh, University of uh, Shanghai published that they independently found the same results and they studied the reaction in detail also with other metals as catalysts. Well, we found that uh, also iridium, rhenium, ruthenium, rhodium complexes can catalyze this reaction. And, uh, well, let's have a look for some of their experiments. Okay, here you see their model compound with a bit longer chain here and longer side chain. Um, they applied just one mole transition metal catalyst, found out that it is sufficient. And as you see here, an iridium phosphine complex, 99% result also with an iridium phosphine complex, also ruthenium. Well, with uh, this iridium COD complex, COD is the abbreviation for uh, cyclooctadiene. And with ruthenium chloride, chloride hydrate, well, they didn't get any uh, uh, of that product. So it seems to be important that you have a phosphine complex. 
And indeed, they tested that if you add more ligand, 16 equivalents compared to the catalyst, for instance, then the yield or the conversion here in this case, we also uh, uh, did uh, just uh, uh, a GC analysis, the conversion indeed increases significantly. Well, actually, this is a bit strange. Mm -hmm. So, as we know, uh, normally you need a coordinatively unsaturated transition metal complex as the active complex. And therefore, having a huge excess of the phosphine ligands should generally slow down your reaction. This is what we should keep in mind if we uh, try transition metal reaction. And this is an unusual example, <coughs> indeed, because this claims that it is the opposite in that case. Well, okay, uh, about two years later, in uh, 1992 or 1993, there was a new postdoc in the Trost group, Uli Katzmeier, uh, who I know very well. He is now a professor at the University of Saarbrücken. And what he did is something very important. He did some blank tests and found out that you can just skip the transition metal salt. You just need uh, the phosphine. So actually, this is not a transition metal catalyzed reaction at all. It is a case of organo catalysis, where small organic compounds catalyze the reaction. So we have, obviously, to revise the mechanism. So let's have a look to the revised mechanism. Nevertheless, discussing that makes sense, because uh, <coughs> these are indeed typical reaction steps which uh, we will see throughout the uh, uh, uh <coughs> next parts of the lecture. So, what is the revised mechanism after Uli Katzmeier found out that you don't need the transition metal? Obviously, there is the direct interaction of the phosphine. Oh, well, let's, because you can also apply <coughs> other phosphines uh, than the triphenylphosphine, just abbreviate that also substituent as R. So you need a direct interaction you have the free electron pair at the phosphine and phosphine and uh, it will of course attack as a nucleophile could be here or there well hard soft acid base principle it should preferentially um, attack at the electrophilic batter position and all reaction steps are in equilibrium so if we now protonate in equilibrium And this explains you need these protonation and deprotonation step in that mechanism. This explains why uh, a bit of acidic acid accelerates the reaction. So you will protonate here, and the enol will be transformed to the ketone.
So where will a deprotonation take place in close proximity to the uh, phosphonium cation and in conjugation these protons are rather acidic So, protonating again, why not a second time here, getting to a ketone again. Next step is again a deprotonation. Of course, a deprotonation could lead us back to here, but since this is an equilibrium, it will react in this direction, it also will direct, uh, react in another direction. Here, this position also becomes somewhat acidic. If we deprotonate here, what do we have as an intermediate? In this case, we have a conjugated ullet as an intermediate, as we know it from, for instance, Wittig type processes. So now imagine that we deprotonate the, in the ketone at this position and reprotonate here. So it's just a transfer of a proton from this position to that one. So then we have again an enolate and here a phosphonium as a good leaving group. And indeed <coughs> the phosphino group leaves the molecule and, well, this is then the formation of the final product. I think it's a m nice mechanism. And for some other examples we will discuss soon, it's important to notice that alternatively to deprotonating here in this position, a nucleophile could attack plus a nucleophile with an anionic charge.
And this allows us to inter introduce substituents that uh, get into the molecule as nucleophiles. Numerous applications have been found for uh, <coughs> this type of process. Well, what uh, already Uli Katzmeier did during his postdoc studies was testing if also alenes will be isomerized by phosphine catalysis. Well, and indeed, triphenylphosphine, toluene, just 60 degrees, two hours reaction time, I summarizes the allene to the corresponding diene system. Well, 90% yield was uh, obtained, isolated yield. So, now two examples. There a nucleophile is introduced. So, if we compare that with the starting compound. So, where is the nucleophile introduced? Alpha, beta, gamma position. To the gamma position of the original uh, starting compound. So, this is the alpha, the beta, the gamma position. That means the nucleophile is introduced here. This becomes, sometimes during the reaction, an electrophilic position. So since this is acidic here, this is normally regarded as potentially nucleophilic. That means this phosphine catalysis while um, effects an umpolung of reactivity in this position. So, <coughs> first example. An alkynulic acid, aster, alpha, better, gamma position. The nucleophile will be introduced to that position. And again, developed in Barry Trost's research group. This is a typical nucleophile. If you deprotonate that, that melonate then. So, and 35% uh, triphenylphosphine, 50% of an acetic acid, sodium acetate buffer, once again, toluene as a solvent, 110 degrees, 20 hours reaction time. So, and as I said, the nucleophile is introduced to the uh, gamma position, while the alkyne is again transformed to an alkene. and this product is, was isolated with 59% yield. Another interesting example. Now, DPPP was 
used as an rather good catalyst. So what is DPPP? Oh, B, abbreviated butane, F, ferrocene, P, just propane. E would be ethane diol bridge between the two phosphenyl substituents. It's this one. <coughs> so, <coughs> as a result, a spirocycle was obtained. The oxygen of the hydroxyl group will work as the nucleophile, and this nucleophile again attacks at the gamma position, alpha, beta, gamma. So an oxygen carbon bond is formed here. OK. And uh, therefore, it should be clear that this is the anticipated product, which was indeed obtained. So what is uh, a clue for applying that uh, bidentate ligand? Well, as a reactive intermediate, you should have Sorry. This one. One, two, three. Okay, and here you have the second phosphenyl group with a free electron pair, basic, and uh, just deprotonating. Attacking as a nucleophile here and uh, effecting the formation of that bullet as reactive intermediate. Well, I don't have the yield obtained in this case, but it was also in the range of 60 to 70 percent. <coughs> Other groups became interesting, uh, interested in uh, this uh, type of process. For instance, Gregory Fu group at uh, uh, MIT. Here's an interesting example from Fu's group. He used 50% of benzoic acid and 10% of uh, the phosphine catalyst. So, and uh, this is the product we should anticipate for also from already from uh, 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 trust group results. So, what is new from uh, Gregory Fu's group? Well, they optimized it for enhanced selective synthesis. They obtained 
this product enunciates selectively with an 82% yield and 94% enantiomeric excess when applying a chiral phosphine a spirocyclic and a trope chiral phosphine. Not that easy to draw. And this is this should be the S enantiomer. So let's go on with uh, a bit more complicated example from uh, Ikuyoshi Tomito's Tomita's group in uh, from the Tokyo Institute of Technology. So he chose to apply this type of substrate where we have an alkynone, typical for uh, the reactions we already discussed. And now, in uh, the side chain, uh, intramolecularly, a functionality. <coughs> Applying 20% of uh, tris and butyl phosphine THF at uh, reflux, reflux temperature, I think. He obtained up to 70% of products of this type. racemic, however these are of course interesting structures. So let's think about what happened here. Well, at some stage of reaction an aldol addition step has obviously taken place. <coughs> so the mechanistic interpretation follows what we have discussed before uh, at the Trost example. <coughs> so the phosphine attacks as a nucleophile Let's stay with a butyl, <coughs> tributyl phosphine. Here we are. Here we are prime substituent. Again, protonating at this position the lead to the ketone again. So, the ketone should be acidic in alpha position, well it is already acidic there, but the acidity will increase since 
the whole molecule is positively charged. So, deprotonating here and then intramolecularly attacking the carbonyl group in the sense of an aldol addition step. One, two, three, four, five position. That uh, means we will build up a five membered carbocyclic ring. So, and now, oh, let's put a minus charge here. Now this is the position to attack with a nucleophile that we get the ulit formed. Deprotonating here, protonating there, means setting up the system for eliminating the phosphonyl group, the phosphonium group. Yeah, well, okay, and that's all. Setting free the active catalyst. Finally, let's try an exercise. Again, Gregory Fu thought let's modify this type of process. and having an alpha beta and saturated ester offered intramolecularly. Twenty percent of the phosphine as catalyst, again a bit of acid and now it's your turn as an exercise, please figure out the structure of a product. So let's compare the substrate with the one we have studied before. So, so it's very similar. Actually, it is always same except that this oxygen has been replaced by that carbon CH and here that ester sitting there. Yeah? Well, okay, and our prime changed to an hydrogen. That's it here. Yeah. So that means, in principle, we could draw here the product which we have seen before. 
but wi not with an oxygen there. having hydrogens at this position. And now, again, let's exchange the oxygen here against a CH group. And at that carbon, the ester group is also sitting. Oh, that's it. So, and uh, of course, the full group again applied their chiral phosphine and therefore um, <coughs> achieve uh, chiral induction. And this one was the product they obtained well, with a moderate, but nevertheless, uh, nice 60% in enzymeric excess. So, um, <coughs> this was a small journey to uh, <coughs> organocatalysis, and I promise uh, tomorrow we will go on, on with uh, real transition metal catalysis. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow.